Hey, so hello everybody. My name is Sarah Reeves and I'm the marketing manager for New Society Publishers. We thank you for joining us today, either on Zoom or viewing our live stream on Facebook um, for our talk with Bevan Cohen. Um, and please continue to let us know where you're com uh, coming from by commenting in the chat area. During the event, please post any questions that you have in the Q&A area. Now, I know people on Facebook, just put your questions in the comment and Nicole will pull those over for us. But if you are in the Zoom, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to as many of those at the end of the chat uh, as time allows us. We are also going to choose someone um, from the questions posted uh, to win a copy of the Complete Guide to Seed and Nut Oils, Growing, Foraging and Pressing by Bevan Cohen. So this is the book we're talking about today. Um, and you can also receive a 20% discount on the Complete Guide to Seed and Nut Oils, as well as Bevan's other title, The Artisan Herbalist, with the code BEVIN, B-E-V-I-N 20, at our website, newsociety.com. And Nicole, who's helping out behind the scenes, will post the links to those books um, in the chat for you. Um, and again, the code is BEVIN 20, and Nicole will put that in the chat as well so that you can make sure that uh, if you'd like to get a copy of, of his books, you can receive that discount. in keeping with Indigenous culture and to build respectful relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, we acknowledge that our office is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Sunamo First Nation, the keepers of this land since time immemorial. As settlers, it's important to recognize that although we call this place home, the Sunamo First Nation never ceded their lands to the Crown. And I'd also like to mention that I'm actually broadcasting today from the Indigenous by Design Conference on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. An integral part of New Society's mission and vision has been to publish books for a world of change in a way that has a minimal impact on our environment to help build a just and ecologically sustainable society. For this work to remain authentic and meaningful, we acknowledge our settler privilege and understand the impact it has on the land and Indigenous people. You can find out more about New Society and how we put people and planet first at newsociety.com. And Nicole uh, will post links to our full land acknowledgement and call for decolonization, as well as our statement of ethics in the chat. So please now join me in welcoming Bevan Cohen. Bevan is an herbalist, gardener, seed saver, educator and the author of The Complete Guide to Seed and Nut Oils, as well as The Art of Sand Herbalist. He's the owner of Small House Farm, and he offers herbal products and oils, as well as leading workshops and lectures nationwide on the benefits of living closer to the land. And he lives in Sanford, Michigan. Uh, Kevin, welcome. Hello, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really looking forward to this time that we have to spend together uh, talking about my book, The Complete Guide to Seed and Nut Oils. So let's get started. I'll go ahead and share my screen and um, we'll get rolling on this thing. So a little bit about myself. I know Sarah kind of already introduced me, but we'll just give a little bit here. Um, my name is Bevan Cohen and I'm from Small House Farm. Um, and, you know, it's kind of funny, but I like to show a picture of my house at the because when I tell folks from Small House Farm, inevitably everybody thinks that I live in a tiny house. And that's not the case. As you can see, it's a regular size home, most certainly. Uh, what's it like 1,100 square foot or something? Plenty of space for everybody. Um, although I do have two boys, uh, my, my wife Heather and I, we have two sons, Elijah and Anakin. And I tell you, those kids seem to get bigger overnight. So it's getting a little crowded around the small house. But for now, it's working out just fine for us. Small House Farm is really left about the size of the building that we live in. It's more about our philosophy on life. Uh, we are on a dead end dirt road. We're across the street from 1100 acres of forest. So we're able to do a lot of foraging out in those woods for our food, as well as for our medicine. On the farm, a majority of what we grow is for personal consumption, although we do grow herbs um, and seed crops. Uh, we offer quite a bit of uh, heirloom garden seeds via our website and some uh, wholesale accounts that we have, as well as seeds that we grow specifically for oil production. And that's what we're going to talk about today. 
Um, now, I guess you could say my nine to five, my nine to five job is um, what you see here on the screen, this, this full line of products. We take the oils that we cold press. You can see a couple of them here, the sunflower oil and the hemp seed oil, which are probably our two most popular products um, oil wise. Then we take these oils and the herbs that we grow on our farm or that I gather from the wild, and we craft a full line of wellness products. We've got salves and lotions and all sorts of different stuff. Um, not a bad job. I've had worse jobs, most certainly. Uh, some days my um, entire day at work is spent out in the forest uh, gathering herbs. And it certainly could be worse than that. Um, we're very lucky, very, very lucky to be in the position that we are for what we do for work, as well as just where we happen to live. It's just a beautiful forest right in central Michigan. Now, of course, these oils, we do use them topically in these products, but they're all culinary oils as well. They're all edible. They're all delicious. And we also utilize them in the kitchen. Not only do we press oils for commercial use, we press oils for personal use too. It's some of the best oils, and I'm hoping to get you guys turned on to doing it as well. Most of what we're going to talk about, obviously, today is going to come from this book. Here it is, uh, The Complete Guide to Seed and Nut Oils. And Anya, I wish that I would have had this book 10 years ago. Um, it was about 10 years ago when I started pressing oil. Um, for the very first time. And I sure could have um, avoided a lot of mistakes and challenges if I would have had a book like this, but I, there wasn't anything like this. Um, to my knowledge, there is no other book like this one. Um, so I've been able to take a decade of experiences, um, mistakes and challenges and everything and put them inside of this book. So those of you that decide to purchase the book and use it, you can skip all those mistakes I made and fast forward to the good part, um, enjoying delicious, fresh cold press oils right at home. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story about how we got started. So. A lifetime ago, uh, many, many moons, many moons ago, um, I used to do uh, marketing for an insurance company. That was my job. And it was uh, not, not, I was not suited to that position. I did the job well, but I did not like being indoors in an office all day long. It was not meant for me. Um, so eventually I decided that I was going to move away from this, this corporate lifestyle. And we bought the farm and we, we came out here um, to Small House Farm. Um, I didn't really have a plan outside of leaving my job and buying the farm. I didn't know what I was really going to do when we got here, but I figured as with all things in nature, it would just unfold uh, organically on its own. So we came out here and uh, I was reading an article, one of our first nights out here, I was reading an article in an organic garden magazine or something like that. And it was a story about a couple that had left their corporate jobs behind to, to find a new, more, more meaningful lifestyle for themselves. And they had purchased an old windmill um, they renovated this windmill and then they convinced the local farmers around them to grow this organic wheat um, and they were bringing the grains to the mill and grinding this flour and they created a very successful business out of this. And I thought, oh, this, that's inspiring to me, uh, especially since I'm trying to find my new path here. Very inspiring. But unfortunately, there was no windmills for sale around me, um, so I had to find something different to do. And in the back of that magazine, I saw an advertisement for an oil press, uh, just a simple hand turn pitable brand oil press. And I got pictures of the actual press coming up in a little bit so you guys can see it. Um, and I thought, well, I've never heard of anybody pressing their own oil before. So this is maybe a great idea or it's a really bad idea. I wasn't sure. Um, but you know, my wife, who I say is the most patient woman on the planet, she has to deal with me every day. Um, she said, right, if this is what you think you want to try to do, go ahead. So I purchased this press. And I brought it home. And it was a little hand crank number, you know, and I have a friend down the way that was growing some sunflowers. So I got some sunflower seeds from him and I brought it back here and pressing it through the press and, and producing our own sunflower oil. And it was, it was beautiful and it was delicious. And I thought, well, this is some nice stuff, right? Well, I didn't really have uh, anything to compare it to, I suppose, aside from what was at the grocery store. And I knew that that was incomparable. The stuff at the grocery store was not nearly as good as what I was producing here at the farm. But there was a lady in the town nearby that had one of those little olive oil stores where you could come and sample olive oil and purchase bottles or whatever. So I took it to her. Her name was Peggy. And I took this oil to Peggy. I said, look what I produced on our little farm uh, in Sanford. And she says, oh, Bevan, this is really good stuff. You could probably offer this commercially. And that's all I needed to hear. Uh, I rented a little table at our local farmer's market, set up my booth, and I had, what, six or eight bottles of sunflower oil. We'll go back to the slide. See the picture of the sunflower oil? That's the label that we used that day. It's the label that we still had, a little flower drawn by a friend of mine, a uh, little artist. I need a picture of a sunflower. She drew it up real quick. We slapped it on the bottles. I had six or eight bottles with me. Set them up at the farmer's market. I was very, very excited. I sold out in 20 minutes like that i didn't even have a lot of product but still you know it was very exciting folks that come to the farmer's market they like to support local they want to understand how things are being grown how things are being produced that relationship to their producers is very important as it should be and they'd never seen anybody selling 
small, small batch cold pressed oil like that. So they bought it right up and that was all the encouragement I needed. We just kept pushing forward with it. Uh, just kept pressing and pressing. It, it was a workout, right? Pressing and pressing. And uh, that's kind of the cornerstone of what created everything that we do here at Small House Farm. And then in 2017, we won a good food award for our hemp seed oil that we were pressing. Um, it turns out we were the first hemp seed oil that had ever been even a part of the competition before. Um, so we won this award. It was a, a blind taste test with some, some magazine writers and some foodies and some chefs and that sort of thing. And um, we won the award and it was very big for us. And we got a lot of press um, all over nationwide. You know, we were in a bunch of magazines. It was, it was a big thing. Very unexpected. Uh, very awesome though, right? And uh, it just snowballed the business out of control. Um, suddenly we were, we were, people were buying oil on our website. We were shipping it all over the country. And, you know, we moved from our little farm here where we were pressing the oil. We got a, a commercial facility where we had to go to press the oil. And uh, it really became quite a thing. Um, and like I said, it's become the foundation of everything that we do at Small House. Now I'm constantly trying to scale back, always trying to scale back. That's the reason that I moved out to Small House Farm. So that's a lesson I'm always trying to teach myself is to, can you scale back, slow down, slow down. Uh, but I am very thankful for the momentum that the Good Food Award caused for us. Um, and it allowed us to share this delicious fresh oil with so many people um, to help open their eyes to the fact that this is something that all of us can do right in our own homes. We can press our own delicious oils for culinary applications, for wellness applications. That doesn't matter with seed crops that we can grow right on our farms or that we can even gather from the wild right around us. People have been pressing oil from seeds and nuts and fruits since pretty much the dawn of agriculture, right? Um, they talk about pressing olive oil in the Bible. Um, they've been doing it in, in Asia for possibly even longer than that, a very long time, right? And this is essentially the technology that they use. And it's really not that much different than the technology that I use. Uh, let me walk you through this. So what we're looking at here um, is in the trough, in the circular stone trough um, is where the seeds go. And then the stone wheel is pulled around in a circle by this beast of burden, you know, and then the wheel, crushes those seeds, just using simple pressure to extract the oil um, from the seeds. Now, unfortunately, this photo doesn't quite show everything that I want you to see. If you can imagine now all the way to the right of the photo where it kind of gets cut off by the edge of the slide, um, there's a little bit of a, a spout, if you will, right? And the, the entire circular slab is at a slight angle. So gravity allows that oil to flow towards that spout where it then pours out and is collected in a separate container. Um, so, but What's happening here is just pressure, squeezing those seeds to get them to release their oil. And that's really no different than what we're doing here at Small House or what you can do on your home or farm as well. Now I've used the term, and we'll talk about how that works. I've used the term fresh cold press oils probably a couple of times already. So let's kind of break that down just so you know what I mean when I say it, um, just so we're all on the same page, right? Fresh, that's pretty obvious right? The oils that we're pressing are fresh. You know, they are pressed and enjoyed within the week of pressing them. And that's the beauty of it. If you go to buy oils at the grocery store, even the high dollar expeller pressed oils, and we'll talk about what that means in a second, even the fanciest oils at the grocery store are on those shelves. And I'm being generous with this number on that shelf for six months, sometimes up to a year, right? And oil is essentially fat, right? And over time, it's going to down and it's going to go rancid, right? So time is of the essence when it comes to quality oils. The fresher the oil, the better. And there is no fresher oil available than what we're pressing right in our own homes, right? It's got the most, most flavor, the most aroma, the most nutritional benefits. The fresher the oil, the better. Now cold pressed, what does this mean? And you're probably familiar with this. You'll see this um, on different packages at the grocery for sure. Um, a cold pressed oil is an oil that has been pressed um, at a temperature of about 120 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, right? And this is important. When we reach higher temperatures above that 120 degree Fahrenheit mark, when we get higher than that, we start to break down that oil. We degrade the quality of the oil. Just that simple, the heat is gonna break the fat down and it's gonna cause that oil to go rancid. So you're gonna lose your flavors, you're gonna lose your nutritional value, but cold press oils, pressed temperatures below 120 degrees Fahrenheit are the most nutritious and the most flavorful. And that's what we get to produce at home. The best of the best is what we can make when we press our own oils. Now let's talk about these different methods of extraction. I said expeller press, let's break down what I mean by that. When we think about that wheel that we were just looking at, utilizing pressure to squeeze the seeds to get the oil out of them, 
that's what an expeller press does. And I got a picture of it, hopefully maybe in the next slide, but, um, of the pit of a press that we use. And it's essentially, it's just using pressure. Again, the seeds are loaded, they come through the hopper into a chamber and a graduated turn screw squeezes those seeds, squeezing those seeds, utilizing pressure, only pressure to get the oil out. Now the opposite of this is chemical extraction. A great majority of the oils that they're gonna purchase at the grocery store are chemically extracted oils. So it's a solvent extraction. Um, and the solvent that's typically used in commercial production is hexane. And hexane is just a couple molecules away from being gasoline, all right? Um, so I don't know about you, everybody's living their own life. But for me, uh, it's my personal preference that I do not want those sorts of things um, in my food or on my body or on my family or on my community, right? I wanna steer clear from these solvent chemically extracted oils. These, these oils are also not only just extracted with hexane, but then they're also bleached and deodorized and degummed. They go through quite a process, most certainly. And the final product, the refined oil, is not nearly as good as the oil that you can cold press, guaranteed. If you were to take an expeller pressed sunflower oil with its gold and dark color, its beautiful sunflower aroma, and compare it to a refined sunflower oil from the grocery store, which is very pale, sad yellow color, has no aroma, barely any flavor at all. You almost can't even distinguish that it's a sunflower oil. They do this on purpose, right? To take as much of the oil, the, those qualities out of the oil as they can to refine it, to make it shelf stable. That chemically extracted sunflower oil can easily sit on the shelf at the grocery store for a year and you won't even notice a difference in it. You know, it's exactly the same. But as far as I'm concerned, that's not even food. Uh, we need the good stuff, right? We need expeller pressed oils. Um, so when you purchase oils at the grocery, you can go and look and look on the back of the bottle and they will mention if it's expeller pressed, right? Expeller pressed oils, like we can make right at home, you don't get as high of a yield as you're gonna get from a chemically extracted oil. Um, it's not quite as profitable to make them. And at the end of the day, at the grocery, the folks selling things at the grocery, it's about profits, right? Um, so they're trying to make the most profitable oils possible. And sometimes they sacrifice quality to do that. It's funny if you think about when we make our decisions based on monetary gain, sometimes we make different decisions than we would otherwise, right? Uh, sometimes, sometimes we make different choices, but we have that option to choose producing the highest quality, most delicious, nutritious oils, because we can simply do it right at home, right? Let's get into it. Here's the press. This is the pit of oil press. Exactly. This is the brand. Now there's other presses similar to this style that are made by other companies. Um, similar price points. In my experience, the Pitaba is the highest quality, sturdiest machine that you can get. Um, but if you find other brands, go ahead and try them out. You know, um, I'm not the end all be all on this topic. You know, there's, there could be new products coming out, check them out, try them out. If it's available to you, if it's locally made or something like that, get it and try it. Absolutely. But this is the one that we use here is the Pitaba and you can buy it directly from the company. Um, you can also find them online from a number of sources, most certainly, but it is a very, very simple machine. Uh, let's talk about it. I think the next slide is going to have it broken down into pieces, but let's just talk about it constructed here so we can kind of understand the function. So you can see, obviously, the, the hopper here with the seeds, that's an old water bottle. Um, actually cut in half, this thing doesn't even come with a hopper, so you got to create your own. That's a water bottle that's been the bottom cut off to create my hopper. Happens to fit right into that chamber perfectly. Behind that, you can see the crank, right? Hand turn, um, crank, that's what we're going to turn. And that's attached directly to the screw, this graduated turn screw. And you'll see it in the next slide up close. Um, this graduated turn screw that's inside of that chamber. So the seeds fall from the hopper into that chamber and then are crushed by that screw, crushed by that screw. Um, the end, you can see this cap. Now with smaller seeds, you're gonna put that little bolt in there because you gotta close that hole up, right? So we can create that pressure as we squeeze it. Um, and there's a little hole in the side that the seed cake will come up. And we'll talk more about seed cake here in a little bit too. But with larger seeds, you can take that bolt off and it's tight enough on its own to create that pressure that we need. Underneath where the seeds drop into the chamber, below that on the bottom side of the chamber is a small slit. And this is where the oil is gonna come up. Then you can see it being collected in that small jar right there. Um, because of the, the style of the screw, the way that it's graduated, it allows a little space for that oil to run back down the chamber, out that slit, to then be collected um, in, that little, in that little jar there. Next to that jar, you'll see another little bottle. This is actually a small kerosene lamp that comes with it. Um, and you have rubber bands on it, it attaches to keep it sturdy, this little kerosene lamp. And the flame is inside that chamber right there. Um, now, what this does, it, although it still is below 120 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's still technically cold pressed oils, that little bit of heat 
warming up the machine, warming up that metal, um, just that, that warmth is going to coax more oil. You're going to get higher yields out of your seeds. You don't have to run that kerosene lamp. You'll still be able to press the oil, uh, but that little bit of heat is definitely going to increase your yields, coaxing more oil out of your seeds and nuts. I often recommend um, warming up your seeds or nuts even before you load them into the, the hopper. That warmth is really going to help, again, higher yields, increase your yields, get a little bit more oil out of your oil seed crops. Here's the uh, press broken down into parts. So you can see it, the kerosene uh, lamp is still attached right there by that rubber band. So you can see how that works. Um, and here's all the parts. Now let's take a look at that, that screw right there. See the, see the style of that screw, how it gets the thicker as it moves towards the end, the graduated turn screw, that's what that's called. Um, that's designed specifically to help not only push the seed forward and creating a tighter chamber at the end to, to get that pressure, but it also allows that little bit of space for the oil to be come back to come out the slit, which you can see a lot more clear in this photo. See the slit right there um, where the oil is going to drip out. Very, very basic machine, essentially just a few parts here. Um, there's an assortment of washers that come with it. Uh, most of those are replacement washers. You're gonna use like two at a time, one that's gonna go on the end of the, uh, the screw that goes into the chamber and one on the outside where you attach the, the, uh, the handle. Um, and then those bolts and, and screws and things that come with it, you can see on the base of the body of the press, you'll see those holes there um, because you're gonna need to mount it to something, right? It comes just like this and you're gonna wanna mount it to your own table, workbench, whatever is gonna be uh, accessible and easy for you. Um, but you're gonna wanna make sure it's secure because it's really a lot of pressure that's gonna go uh, into this thing when you're cranking this seeds, especially harder seeds, things like flax and that sort of thing. It's gonna create a lot of pressure. So you're gonna wanna make sure it's very, very secure. Um, so you kind of, trial and error that. That's what we did. Um, I wasn't much of a carpenter 10 years ago when we started this and I've come a long way. I've learned a lot of tricks um, and you will too. Then that's the beauty of life is, is learning and making some mistakes and that sort of thing. But through the book, I walk you through a lot of those mistakes and help you find the best ways to secure that press and to, to get the most out of it. Um, you know, decrease your labor, increase your outputs. That's the best way to do things, right? Now, I can only press oil so much by hand, um, especially once we won that good food award and uh, our demand increased like it was. I was cranking that thing. I was up all night, so just crank, crank, crank. Problem that I had is I couldn't seem to get my left arm to do the job. I couldn't get the, I couldn't get it. Um, so my joke always was I had a Popeye and a Wimpy, you know, because this arm was was working hard and this arm wasn't really doing anything. It was just along for the ride. Um, and I was getting to the point of physical exhaustion, trying to keep up with the demand. Now, if you're just pressing oil for your use at home, you don't have to worry about that. If you're going to try to do it commercially, you are going to quickly exceed the capabilities of your own body. Um, the machine could have gone all night, but not so much for me. You know? um, we upgraded. You can see these machines here. These are electric models that we eventually upgraded to. These are specifically for commercial production. Uh, but the technology, that what's happening here is exactly the same. We can go back to that wheel, utilizing pressure, the hand crank, utilizing pressure. This is the same thing. It's a graduated turn screw in a chamber. You load it into the hopper. It's exactly the same. Most of this machine is the box on the back, which is the motor, right? It's motorized. You load the seeds into the hopper. You flip the switch. Off it goes, right? Anybody can do that. Um, and that really was a game changer for us on a commercial level to be able to run multiple machines, allowing to free up my body to go into other things. Um, it, it really, really made a big difference for us. But for you guys at home, you don't have to worry about this sort of thing. These machines are not cheap. Um, they were difficult to find. I could not even find an American made tabletop model. Um, so we had to buy it from overseas and they were not, they were not inexpensive. You know, they, they was definitely an investment. It's paid for itself, certainly, um, but at the time it was really, you know, it's a commitment to, to make this purchase, but you don't have to worry about it because I got some other workarounds for you. We get into depth on them in the book, but I'm going to touch on them right here for you right now. Ready? Look at this. I took my hand turn, bit of an oil press, and I just rigged it up to a motor myself, essentially creating what I could purchase, this machine, I made my own, right? Pretty basic stuff. Um, now, what I've done here is you can see that the press is attached to a small board. Right? So I've attached the press and the motor to this one board, and then I can take that board to separate places, clamp it down to a table to make sure it's nice and secure, really easy to go. So now I can flip the switch, run that motor, and press my oil. I got a simple pulley that I then attach to the screw um, on the press, and so very, very simple stuff. I've created a hopper 
loaded into it. It's essentially just a really big funnel that I got from a brew supply house that's on there. And now you can see the little jar where we're collecting the oil right there. And that's really for the photo. So you can see the oil right there. Um, in reality, when I press in the oil here, what I actually do is I'll get a small plastic funnel and I'll attach it to the press right up uh, where that slit is at with a couple of rubber bands. And then I got some like aquarium hose that I then run from the funnel down to a bucket on the ground, right? So I got a big hopper, I got a big bucket I'm collecting the oil in. It's very hands-off. I don't have to come and deal with it. If I was just using this little jar, I'd have to dump this little jar out all the time. Um, and that would, that would you know, be frustrating. <laughs> that's that's a, it's a waste of my time. So we just hook up that little funnel. It's gonna do the work for me. I can flip the switch, walk away, come back, no problem at all. Easy way to handle it. But we can make it even easier, even more fun. First, let's talk about this, I guess. Um, so look at this picture, right? You can see I'm just using an old black uh, motor belt right there, which works just fine. But this vibration-free belt is really, really nice. Um, you know, the vibration-free so it doesn't shake, but what I really like about it is you can kind of tell by looking at the picture, those little tabs, you can pull those little tabs and you can pop that out. So I can just take links off of this chain and make it any length that I want it to be, which is really, really nice because it's important that you have a tight belt, right? The tighter the belt, the better revolution that you're going to get. So this one I can adjust by the link to the exact size that I need. And that's really, really handy for sure. And here's when we get to have some fun. When we hook our oil press up to a bicycle, kids, you know, you put your kids on the bike, dangle a carrot in front of them or whatever, and off they go. Um, they're full of energy, so they will press a lot of oil for you, for sure. Um, now, I've replaced the pulley that we used back here. Take a look at it. There's the pulley. You can see that I'm using there. I've replaced that with this sprocket. I got this from a, a bicycle shop. It's your basic average sprocket that will go onto a bicycle. is the exact size that you need. It goes right onto the screw, just like the pulley would. You put that sprocket right on there, and we're using a bike chain. Now, the trick for me, especially since I'm not a carpenter, is um, getting the back wheel of my bicycle up off the ground. There's a couple of ways that we can go about doing this. The first way that I did it is I fabricated a stand of sorts out of two by fours and things, which works okay. It was all right. You know, it was just I just needed to get that wheel up off the ground, most certainly. Um, you can purchase um, little stands that you could put on your bike that essentially turns your bicycle into a stationary bike, an exercise bike. Um, it just, all it's doing is taking that back wheel up off the ground. You can buy those online. They're pretty inexpensive, 20 bucks or so. Um, not a bad investment for what you get out of it. But what we've ended up doing is I just got an old exercise bike, um, an actual stationary bike. Well, I got it through the Facebook marketplace or whatever it was, you know, I paid 20 bucks for it or something. And, um, it's already a stationary bike. It was ready to go. I took two bicycle chains. I popped the link out so I could connect them to each other to make a double long bicycle chain, right? So I got my stationary bike, my double long chain comes right up to this board, which is attached to a table. Then you just pedal it. Um, super, super simple. Uh, a really fun way to press your own oil. Um, and you get to utilize your legs instead of trying to crank it with your arm too. So that's kind of nice. You get your upper body workout and you can work your legs. Um, so it's a complete <laughs> complete workout, um, easy stuff. And like I said, if you got kids or something like that, they love it. Um, they, they just love to do it. You know, they, kids have fun with pretty much everything that they do, especially if you present it to them right. Despite what technique you use to press your oil, at the end, we're gonna wanna let it settle out, right? Um, we're gonna wanna clean that up a little Bit. So you can just let the oil sit. It'll be very turbid, all the little bits of debris and stuff will we'll all be together, It'll be very cloudy and, and dirty. And you can let it just sit, you know, for a few days, up to a week or so, and all of the bits of debris will just settle out to the bottom. Um, and your oil will clarify, it'll look beautiful and really, really nice. Um, and at that point, if you want to, you can literally just decant that off into a container and you could call that good. That's going to be just fine for what you need. Um, but if you want to, um, you could certainly filter it out. Like you see I'm doing here with this muslin bag. Um, you could use a cheesecloth perhaps, or, you know, that's a type of filtering system just to get any little tiny microscopic bits of debris out of there. And what this is going to do is it's going to increase the shelf life of your oil, most certainly, because there won't be that organic material floating around in there. But also, if you're going to use your oil in the kitchen, um, if you've got little bits of, um, you know, shell or seed or whatever might be in there, those things are going to burn faster in the pan, right? Um, they're going to have a lower smoke point that way. So you can actually increase the smoke point of your oil if you clean it up really nice. So run it through a filter. I always recommend um, you don't have to most, you know, whatever you want to do, but 
I recommend putting your oil through a filter. It's gonna, like I said, increase the shelf life, which is important, but only so important because one of the reasons that we want to press our own oil is so we can have the freshest oil available, right? So you don't want to press gallons of oil and then just store them until you need them. Um, just press what you need for the week, you know, and then you have the freshest oil available that week and then you can press a little bit more. It doesn't take long to press a week's worth of oil. Um, I got some numbers coming up. We can see that, but think about how you utilize oil at home. Um, you at every meal, most likely, or at least a couple times a day, you're going to be using it as a salad dressing, you're going to be using it when you saute or something, you're going to be using it if you make lotion, whatever it might be. But we're just using it a tablespoon here, a couple tablespoons there. We're not using lots and lots of oil unless we're deep frying stuff. Um, so we don't need to press a lot of oil every week. So it's really simple to do to, to press the oil that you need. Um, especially if you're utilizing a, a bicycle or something like that to really take the work out of it. Now, we also need some other equipment times when we're pressing oil, uh, if we're dealing with things like walnuts, uh, hazelnuts, these sorts of things, tree, we have to remove these shells and that sort of thing. So um, we get into it in depth in the book as well, some, some uh, additional equipment needs that we might have, not crackers and that sort of thing. Um, this is a little tabletop job for cracking walnuts. Uh, it works pretty well. Uh, not for large quantities. It's a little, it'll a little, you know, waste a little time if I feel like using it. Um, we could use a bigger machine, but it certainly will get the job done. What we have done with our walnuts now, uh, since we're using so many, it seems, um, once we've got the green hull off of them, which is the easiest way to get the green hull off of your walnuts is to run it through uh, one of those corn cob shellers. It's like you'd use to take the corn kernels off a ear of corn. Um, you run your green walnuts through there and just shells them right out. And then you can just bash your walnuts with a hammer and break them into pieces. It's going to be all right. Um, put them in cold water and they will separate out. The, uh, the shells will flow and the meats of the nut will sink. Uh, so it's an easy way to separate them out. And then you can just take your wet nuts and put them, uh, and you can lay them out to dry somewhere. You can even put them in your oven on a low temp, maybe with the door open, dry them out, warm them up a little bit because once they're warm, a little toasty, mm. They're going to get more oil. It's going to be a great flavor. Run it through your press. You're going to watch your walnut pieces in small pieces anyway, so they fit through the hopper into the chamber. Um, so it's an easy, easy way to deal with that. Oh, this guy's cool. This, this, it's a tumbler style cracker. We got some hazelnuts in it right here. Um, inside of this thing is a bunch of sharp teeth on two wheels that line up like this. And you can just fill this hopper up and crank it. And those, those wheels will spin. They spin in towards each other and it just smashes the shell. <laughs> Super simple. You can do a lot of, lot of hazelnuts, acorns, that sort of thing, uh, quite quickly with one of these. And for the most part, because of the spacing on the teeth, the nuts themselves actually remain whole. Um, so it's a really quick way just to get those shells busted and uh, away from your nuts. Um, speed up the process a little bit for sure. So let's talk about some of these crops. These are probably the five most popular oilseed crops here at Small House Farm, as far as what uh, seems to be the most pop popular commercially. This seems to be what our customers like to buy the most of. Um, so we press quite a bit of these five things. Um, the three that we're gonna talk about the most today are gonna be hemp, sunflower, and pumpkin. Uh, the reason that we're gonna talk about these is because um, they're easy to press. Um, they're delicious oils and I want people doing it. You guys gotta do it. So we're gonna talk about it so you know just how easy and wonderful it can be. We'll talk about sunflowers first because sunflowers are probably the easiest to grow in most places. Um, there's a sunflower variety that will perform pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, they're exponential, the amount of seeds that you get. Uh, you get a lot of seeds from one seed, right? So they're very easy to grow quite a bit of sunflower um, to, to produce quite a bit of sunflower oil. Um, it's something that anybody could do, I think. So the type of sunflower that you want, you're gonna want an oil seed type. You, know, you might be familiar with if you buy bird seed, um, the black oil sunflower seeds that come in bird seeds, those are exactly what you want for oil pressing, right? Those particular sunflowers have been bred to have large, meaty, high oil seed, right? It's good for the birds, it's also good for oil production. So those are the types that we're gonna want, um, high oil sunflower seeds. And here's some math, I broke it down for so you can see how simple this is. Um, sunflowers are what I call a whole seed crop, right? We don't have to shell sunflowers. 
you can just put your sunflower seeds, shell and all, right through your press, no problem at all. Um, you know, and I think that, that that's taking that extra step out there, having the shell things, taking that step out makes it that much easier. So this is a great beginner seed to get you going, all right? But look at this. 10 pounds of sunflower seeds. And this is an average, you know, there's some variables here and there, but on average, 10 pounds of sunflower seeds will produce a gallon of oil. That's quite a bit of oil. An acre of sunflowers will produce 200 gallons of oil. That's a lot, right? Around here where we're at in Michigan, there's a lot of little sunflower farms and they'll, uh, they'll have people come out to do uh, photos, photo sessions, graduation photos or whatever they're doing. Um, and that's like the the, the agro tourism that's their main businesses and which is cool it's very cool but they could have this side hustle where after the flowers are done and they're no longer photogenic that we are turning them into oil seed crops right um because oil the sunflower oil retails at approximately a dollar 18 that's american uh per ounce and that varies a lot the prices of things especially right now are just out of whack this has probably changed since i made the slide right i mean Prices are crazy right now, uh, but let's just say, let's go with this number, uh, 118 per ounce. So that means that one acre of sunflowers, $30,000 gross retail sales. That's incredible, right? Especially if it's a value added product. If you're already doing other things with those sunflowers, like having the, the, the folks come take photos, that's amazing. That's amazing. But we could also scale that right now to household use. And we can see that it's not going to take a lot of sunflowers and a lot of space to produce quite a bit of oil, um, quite a bit of oil. And sunflower oil is one of the most delicious, I think. I really, I'm a big fan. We use a lot of it here. Um, I'm in Michigan. We have a lot of sunflowers. I think it's a delicious oil. It just kind of all the, checks all the boxes for me. Um, really, really good stuff. Let's talk about pumpkins. Now, it's probably the most common um, seed pumpkin, right? Um, in Austria, they actually bred, it was a chance mutation when it happened, but they discovered this chance mutation and then worked with it further to, to, to develop a pumpkin seed that has no shell. It's a hullless pumpkin seed. And at the time, that was one of a kind, you know, type of thing. Um, since then, they've developed new, there's quite a few now, there's at least a half dozen that I'm familiar with, um, hullless, you know, no shell seed pumpkins varieties. Awesome stuff. Um, and they make a delicious red green oil. Mm, it's a delicacy for sure, for sure. Um, now for household use, obviously you just have to grow the pumpkins and harvest the seeds and there's some steps to it, um, absolutely. Uh, but on a larger scale, what we're looking at here, this is a pumpkin seed extraction machine, right? Specifically, this is for like a farm seed, you know, seed producers, but it's the same thing. Um, they line the pumpkins up into these rows. The machine comes along. It's got these uh, big forks. To pick the pumpkins up to load them into the machine where they're smashed, blasted with water, pushed through some screens, separating the seed out, and then the flesh of the pumpkin is just dropped out in the field for the deer to enjoy. Pretty awesome stuff. Uh, we worked with a farmer a couple years ago as a cooperative effort amongst a number of farmers in the area to rent one of these machines. We all kind of pooled in on it, um, rented one of these machines, and we were able to get a lot of pumpkin seed that way. It was really, really neat. Now, some of us might be concerned about uh, all that wasted pumpkin on the ground there. I know that I was right away. I like to feed the deer, I suppose, but come on, right? That looks like a lot of food. Uh, what's interesting about these, these hullless seeded pumpkins is that for the most part, the flesh is bland as can be. Just bland as can be. It's not really that delicious. Um, as they've bred these particular traits into the seeds, they've bred out other traits and they've lost a lot of flavor of the pumpkin. So it's really a seed crop is what we're growing here, um, which is good and bad, I suppose. You know, I'd like to use something that's a little more universal. I want to be able to get the seeds out and enjoy the delicious pumpkin, especially here where I'm at. I have limited space. If I'm going to dedicate space to growing pumpkins, that takes up a lot of, a lot of, you know, real estate here. So I need something that I'm going to get the most out of. So styrene pumpkins are all right, but you can press the oil from every squash seed, any and every squash seed. Uh, you can press the oil from and it's going to be delicious. Some varieties are going to yield more than others. You know, there's going to be some differences in flavor profile, most certainly. But the winner, we, you know, we have a whole section of the book talking about it because it's so exciting. Butternut squash. Butternut squash is where it's at. Butternut squash is delicious, number one. That's my one of my favorite types of squash. It stores well, which is very important for me um, to be able to store my squash throughout the winter. Um, so that's checking that box for me. But the the seeds themselves are very high yielding in oil. 
and they're delicious. It produces a very nice oil. Shell and all, doesn't matter. Run it through your press. Um, it's delicious. Um, so for me, the butternut squash is the superior pumpkin uh, for oil production, for food, for everything. So it's, it's my go-to. But you can utilize any type of squash that you got. You can run those seeds through the press. And again, I recommend toasting them, warming them up. Um, you can even toast them like you would like uh, roast your pumpkin seeds before you eat them. Go ahead and roast those and run them through your press. And you'll notice you're going to get a different flavor profile. It's going to be a little uh, more umami, a little deeper, darker flavor, um, which is great. That's fantastic, you know. So you can get kind of a couple different oil products out of your seeds, depending on how you treat them before they go through the press. And hemp, hemp, beautiful hemp. Let's talk about hemp. Um, so hemp is another whole seed crop. We do not need to take the shells off. You don't even want to take the shells off. Uh, the shells are edible too, right? It's high fiber, whatever. Run it through the press. It's the most delicious oil. Now it's heat sensitive. You're not going to want to saute or fry with it. It's a cold culinary oil. It's incredible topical. Dig it. Hemp seed oil has the perfect balance of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids. It has all of the essential amino acids. It's a complete plant protein. It's high in zinc, magnesium, potassium, iron. It is a powerhouse of awesome. Get some hemp seeds, run them through your press. You will be so thankful that you did it. Um, so good, so good. One of the reasons that I like to talk about hemp seed oil in presentations like this is because I want to encourage folks to grow hemp seeds. Please grow some hemp seeds. Um, you know, hemp is making a big resurgence here in the States, I know for sure. Um, CBD products is all the rage right now. Everybody's growing CBD. Um, legal cannabis is a thing. People are growing big fields of that now, uh, which is cool. That's great, whatever. Um, but what's happening is there's still not very many people growing hemp for fiber, which we should be doing, or for grain, for seed production. That's just not as common. Um, and I wish that it was. You know, in, in, our, in our busiest seasons, pressing hemp seed oil, especially right after we won the Good Food Award, we were pressing around 1,800 to 2,000 pounds of hemp seed every year, um, which is, uh, you know, it's a pretty good amount. I couldn't even get that much seed here in the States. I was literally buying my hemp seeds from a farmer over the border from me in Canada. It was easier for me to buy 2,000 pounds of hemp seeds from a Canadian farmer and bring it into the United States than it was for me to find a grower in the United States growing hemp seed. Uh, that, that's crazy to me. So if any of you that are listening right now are industrious folks, um, grow, grow some hemp seeds, grow some hemp seeds, please. Um, there's definitely a market for it. Um, but on a small scale, grow it for yourself, grow it on a larger scale. Uh, contact me if you want. Maybe I can be a customer of yours. That would be fantastic for sure. How about walnuts? Now I'm showing this slide for two reasons, really. I'm, I'm checking two boxes with this one. One, I, I want to let you know that the book also includes a number of crops that nature's already growing for us. So they're not necessarily annual crops like we discussed. These are perennial tree nuts and these sorts of things that we could choose to grow ourselves, but nature's doing it so we could forage them as well. Uh, we talk about things like hickory and walnut and that sort of stuff, how to harvest them, grow them, process them, shell them, all the steps, right? But I also wanted to show this slide because this is an illustration from the book. Um, each of the main oil seed crops in the book um, comes with one of these beautiful illustrations, right? Uh, we worked with an artist. Her name is Alicia Mann. She's from the state of Pennsylvania. Absolute talent this lady has. Just incredible. And she did these beautiful, beautiful illustrations of all the different plants for us, um, showing us the plant, the seed, all the stuff. They're just gorgeous photos. And I just really wanted to show them off. Um, the book is chock full of information. I can promise you that. But the artwork in it, you know, it's a feast for the eyes, for sure. Look at this okra jar. Oh my gosh. And yeah, you can press okra seed oil. Um, you know, if you've ever grown okra, you know that once it reaches a certain stage, it starts to get woody and tough and you don't want to eat it anyways. Let them go. It's okay. You don't have to say, oh, I didn't get some okra in time. No, no, I'm growing okra seeds over here. It's intentional. And you're going to get a lot of seeds out of just a few okra and you'll be able to run them through your press. And it's a very delicate, very delicious oil um, that you can produce from it. Most certainly, um, you know, so it's, there's oil in many things. And so we did talk in the book about the most common crops, most certainly, but I also wanted to talk about some of these things that are a little less common, but also incredible, also delicious, and also something so easy for you to do at home. Oh, how about this? Look at this. Now there's a section in the book where we talk about all three of these crops together, avocados, coconuts, and uh, olives, right? And the difference between these three things that are different than everything else in the book is that 
these three oils are produced from pressing the flesh of the fruit is what we're going to do here as opposed to pressing the seed or the nut um, we're pressing the fruit right all of these things can be done at home and we're going to walk you through every step so if you want coconut oil at home you want olive oil at home you want to make your own avocado oil yeah you do you want it um you can do it easily with that hand turned bit of the oil press um no problem hook it up to your butt if you want to if you're ingenious like that do it and enjoy some delicious fresh cold pressed avocado oil that you made right at your own home mm, that's pretty awesome stuff let's talk about this right quick um, so this is just a picture of the mechanical press that, you know, my, my electric press that I showed you, you can see the box where the motor's at, um, but that's not what I'm showing you here. What I'm trying to show you is on the left, that bowl of stuff. That's the seed cake, right? That's the leftover remains from the extraction process. So the seeds go into the hopper, they get squeezed in the chamber, right? The oil comes out and then out the end comes the seed cake, the leftovers. Um, but it's not a waste by any means. This is a zero waste operation. That seed cake is incredibly useful. We can eat it. This is hemp right there. You, I run that, put it in my food processor, turn it into a powder. I'll throw it in my pancakes. I'll add it to my bread recipes. It is absolutely delicious and super nutritious. Now, remember, since we're expeller pressing our oils, we're not getting 100% yield. We're not getting all of the oil out of the seeds. So there's a little bit of oil that remains in that seed cake. It's delicious and nutritious, and we can certainly utilize it. Um, you could feed it to your livestock. Our pigs and our chickens absolutely love crushed hemp seeds. Um, and it's good for them. You know, the high protein, I think it makes the eggs more flavorful. It's wonderful stuff for sure. Now, if you're crushing seeds where you've still got the shell on them, um, sunflower seeds comes to mind immediately, uh, where you don't want to necessarily eat all those shells. So it's not necessarily a seed cake that you can eat, but again, you could feed it to your livestock. Um, I've composted it. It will make the just the, the blackest, fluffiest soil. Um, it's pretty awesome stuff. So again, zero waste operation even if the stuff coming out the end of the machine is useful oh this slide means we've come to the end of the today uh, here are my four books that I, i've written um the two that most relate to today of course are the complete guide to seed and nut oils which is the book that we just discussed as well as the artist and herbalist both of which came uh, were published by new society publishers and are available on their website and you can utilize that coupon code that was shared in the chat to get 20 percent off the purchase of both of those books today and uh, that's pretty awesome stuff so that is a deal you should certainly take advantage of if you'd like to stay in touch with me though outside of this presentation today here is the facebook and instagram for my farm as well as our youtube channel if you're a visual learner and you like to watch those sorts of things there's lots of different stuff that ends up on youtube uh, but the one-stop shop for everything that we do you can look at our seeds and our herbal products whatever you're interested in um, can be found on our website as you can see at the bottom there smallhousefarm.com all right we can hop into the q a here and see if you guys have any questions i'd be more than happy to answer with the time that we have and thank you so much to everybody that joined us and to new society publishers for hosting us today it was lots of fun spending time with you thank you Thank you so much, Bevan. That was awesome. Um, we've got lots of questions that have come in. I just love that. I feel like you're just demystifying something that seemed to just magically appear on the grocery shelf and that I never really thought that like you could do yourself. So it's really awesome. I always felt like that about canning and then you do it and you're like, hey, that's actually not so bad, right? So right. appreciate that. Um, we'll dive into some of the questions that people have been posting here. And the first one that came up was from the beginning of the chat asking um, how much does is the kind of the average cost of that commercial oil press cost? So I would say maybe start with it. Was it called the Patiba? Um, yeah, the Pitiba is how I pronounce it. I guess I'm not sure how it's pronounced. So the Pitiba <laughs> oil press. Um, I want to say, I think I recently just looked a couple of weeks ago, somebody had asked me about it. And I think you can buy them directly from the company for about $200 right now. Um, so not oh, bad. Yeah, yeah. I expect it to be more. And I really like how you gave people alternatives to get sort of in, inventive at home. And um, I really like the bike one. I'd seen that before. I rode one once making smoothies before. So <laughs> it was pretty amazing what you could do with a bike. Well, that's funny. You know, I got turned on to that idea from our local co-op had turned a bicycle into a smoothie machine and okay. I watched it and I said, oh, I can do this at home. So yeah, we ended up, that's where we got the inspiration for it. Yeah. I learned they, they had apples, whole apples in it. And that was a bit tough. <laughs> get those ones, maybe softer things. Um, the other question that's coming up is, so 
sources of seeds. So Randy and Susan asked the source of hemp seeds. I would expand that to like, if you're not growing it yourself, are there ways to easily access, um, access enough nuts or seeds to, to still do this at home? Sure. So if, if first off, I'm going to say try to grow on the whole. That's what I'd like to see everybody do. But of course, that's not an option for everybody. Um, and that's totally fine. There's other places that we can get our seeds. I would then first connect maybe with our local farmers markets. We can touch up with our farmers if we're looking for things like pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, that sort of thing. Our local farmers could probably help us with that. Um, if we have a local foraging group, might be a great place to get connected with walnuts and hickory nuts and that sort of thing. But once you put the word out, I have people contact me about black walnuts every year, begging me to take buckets of walnuts, right? So just that, that connecting with people, um, building those relationships. If none of those options are gonna pan out for you, have no fear, you can certainly go online um, and purchase seeds and nuts in bulk. And now depending on where you're at, you know, if you're here in the States or in Canada, it might be different. Um, I would just Google um, seed and nuts in bulk, or, or if you're looking for a particular seed, flax seed in bulk, whatever it might be, and a number of resources are going to pop up, and you can find the one that's going to match the price point that's best for you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, again, from Brandy, what RPM motor? Mm. Oh, I don't know that off the top of my head, Brandy. Um, shucks. Okay, so Brandy, you got my contact information off of that slide, hopefully. Um, get a hold of me. I will find out after the presentation. Email me and I will have an answer for you because I do not know that number off the top of my head, unfortunately. Great, thank you. Good question. <laughs> um, Karen asks, is the volume of oil you get determined by the quality of the seeds and the quality of the growing season? Oh, yes. You know, there's a lot of variables that are going to determine the, the quantity of oil that you get. Most certainly the quality of the seed is going to come into to, to play. And that's determined a lot, not only by the varietal that you're working with, but also the growing conditions that it went through that year. Sure. Um, you know, sometimes I've noticed that the speed at which I press the oil sometimes is going to affect the yield that I get. So for each different crop, I found that sometimes slower is better than fast, etc. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some variables that come into play, um, but yeah, the environment that a seed's grown in impacts everything about that, that particular crop, including the, the oil content, sure. Okay, great. Um, and Janine asked, uh, does the book include info on how to set this up and what to purchase? Yes, we walk you through all of your equipment needs, um, a multitude of options for equipment, um, as well as some sources for, for purchasing the things and that sort of thing. We walk you through step one saying, hey, I want to try to press oil all the way through to enjoying the delicious oil at the end, every step of the way. And um, just from Facebook, the question from Nicole, can you use any sunflower seed besides the black bird seed? I have a variety in my garden this year. Next year, I'll do the black ones. Sure, you can. And there's a number of, of sunflowers that are going to give you a high oil content, um, you know, depending again on the varietal, but what you're going to want to look for mostly a, a real good visual clue is going to be the size of the seed. It tends to be the seeds that are bred for that larger size are going to have a high, higher oil content. So larger seeds, you get like a mammoth sunflower or something like that. They're also going to be pretty good uh, yields, you know, so the, the black oil seed that's in the bird feed is the most common and that's why I use it as an example, but there are other varieties of sunflower out there. Um, that do have high yielding oil. The best thing for your, if you want to press, run them all. Run, the ones that you're growing this year, run them through the press and see how they do for you. Um, you know, give them a try. That's that's sort of the beauty of this sort of thing is is learning what's available to you and what's going to work best for you. Um, so so trial and error is, is the best way to proceed with well everything really. Um, well, another follow up to the sunflower question is the growing season of sunflowers, and I suppose that depends on where you live, but is there a general Sure. So sunflowers obviously prefer full sun um, and they're going to they're going to vary. I mean, a sunflower is going to vary from anywhere from like 80 to 120 days, depending on the variety that you're working with. So, you know, finding the one that's going to work best in your climate is also very important. But oil seed sunflowers were developed in Russia, right, in a very cold area with a very short growing season. Um, and if they were able to develop oil seed sunflowers in Russia, we could probably find oil seed varieties that'll grow practically anything, you know? Okay, great. And then 
Um, Sarah asks um, about the large bags of black oil sunflower seeds um, available at farm stores or Costco, and would those be appropriate? Um, or would there be concerns around the, like inorganic sources? For those? Well, yeah, you know, for me personally, I would, if I was going to just purchase a bag of bird seed, I would try to buy an organic, organically grown bird seed, or if I could get it from a farmer. Like I'm lucky enough that here where I'm at in Michigan, there's a lot of folks that actually grow commercial sunflowers so I can get to meet them and see what you know their spray regimen might be or whatever um, you certainly could yes buy those seeds and press the oil from them but if you are concerned about pesticides or anything like that um, that's a place that it's worth to be concerned um, so you're going to want to source um, crops that are grown without those chemicals that would be you probably prefer that and then Janine, again, is do the oils need a preservative added or does it use safe to use without one? But I guess that's why you're making small batches. Right? It's absolutely safe. Um, and even so, dig it, if an oil goes rancid, if the oil goes bad, it will taste bad and it will smell bad, but <laughs> it will not make you that stick. Um, so you, you don't have to worry about like harm coming to you from a bad oil. Um, so no preservatives at all. In the book for each one of the oil seed crops, I talk about specific storage needs and temperatures for each different species because that comes into play. Some oils can certainly sit out at room temperature and they'll be perfectly fine for a long time. Others need to be refrigerated to extend their shelf life. And it's all gonna depend on, on, the, on the particular makeup of those oils, of course. Um, and we talk about that in the book, it's very specifically about temperatures and storage needs. Uh, but for the most part, like with anything, cool and dark is where you're gonna to wanna to put it. Most people store their cooking oils right over their stove for easy access. And that's like the hottest place in your whole kitchen. Right. <laughs> so don't do that. Uh, keep it cool and dark and it'll be fine. You'll be able to tell when your oil goes bad, you'll be able to smell it. Um, right. Especially once you get used to a fresh oil and how good it is, but it's not gonna, it won't make you, it won't. It might make okay. you, it might give you a belly ache, but that's about it. <laughs> um, and the last question, uh, Randy and Susan, uh, asking about if you should soak uh, walnuts. You broke up, I didn't hear. Um, if you should be soaking walnuts. So you, I would assume be, you're talking about soaking walnuts to leach the tannins out of them, I suppose, is what the question is. And I find that that's completely unnecessary uh, with walnuts. I'll run walnuts straight. I'll toast them, warm them up, and run them right through my press. Um, and for the most part, the tannins aren't going to carry over into the oil, and, and it's not going to give it a bitter flavor. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Bevan. That was awesome. Um, just a reminder to everybody that you can pick up a copy of the Complete Guide to Seed and Nut Oils, Growing, Foraging, and Pressing. Um, oh, I don't know if my background blurs it. Out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if everybody wanted to see my hotel room, so I blurred it out there. But um, um, as well as the Artisan Herbalist with the coupon code Bevin, B-E-V-I-N 20 at newsociety.com. Also head over to Bevan's website, Small Heart House Farm, and you can purchase um, his other books as well, as well as some of the products that we were talking about uh, today. Um, and also I'd like to thank Nicole, who's been working behind the scenes with everybody. Oh, and to announce our giveaway winner, who is Janine. Uh, so Janine will be in touch to get your contact details so we can send you a copy of the book. And I would just like to remind everybody, our next live event is June 2nd with Blake Cochran talking about growing berries. So thank you everybody for taking the time out um, with us. And if you wanna watch it again, don't worry, we'll be sending you a recording um, so you can get the information. But the best source is the book and it has all of the information you need in there to start pressing your own oils. Thank you very much, Bevan, and we hope everybody has a wonderful day. I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Enjoy this beautiful day um, for sure. Thanks again, Sarah. Thank you. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye.